gather together to practice the Dhamma. We cultivate our kamatana, our meditation object. This word kamatana means the basis of our work, the work of our mind. Our minds are constantly receiving moods and sense impressions. And these qualities of mindfulness and sampajanya, sati and sampajanya, or mindfulness and clear awareness are very important to care for our minds. So we set our hearts to contemplate the body, feeling, mind, and dhammas. These are the foundations of our mindfulness practice. And we give rise to clear comprehension to sampajanya as well. Because when we have mindfulness, then sampajanya comes along with it. This quality of sampajanya we can call wisdom. So during the day we are sitting, standing, walking and lying down. And when we do these activities, we think that it's the self who stands, the self who walks, the self who sits, the self who lies down. We do our various activities throughout the day, like eating, washing clothes, uh, knowing things, and we think that it's the self that's knowing things. So we have to train. And if we don't train, then the mind will simply cling to materiality and mentality as self, as me, as mine. And this clinging happens a lot, such that the sense of self is very firm. We can say the body is, feels like a pile of rock or metal, something very heavy, full of this sense of self, and the body feels heavy and firm. This is for one without sila. One who has sila, who has virtue and has goodness, and such an individual still has the sense of self, but it's lighter and better. It's within the sphere of sila dhamma, the quality of virtue. And it's been said by the wise that if the world lacks virtue, then the world is ruined, the world is destroyed. And if in the world we have the quality of virtue, then the world is cool and peaceful. Beings are don't kill, don't steal, don't commit sexual misconduct, don't speak badly, don't consume intoxicants. And observing these five principles, then the world is cool and peaceful. You see, for instance, the first precept of not killing it's connected all the way back to the fifth precept of not consuming intoxicants. Because, for instance, if one is drunk and lacks mindfulness, then one can drive in that drunken state and end up killing oneself or killing others. And so we have this energy, we have this power, and beings can be drunk on the sense of self. And this makes the mind hot and agitated with the sense of self makes the world agitated and hot as well. Because we see an individual that has a big sense of self and lacks virtue, this is uh, something dangerous. And the Buddha taught the way to the end of suffering. And the Buddha taught that virtue is an important foundation for this path to freedom from suffering. And when the quality of virtue is well established, we don't yet see not-self, but we're within the sphere of virtue, and this gives rise to coolness. We have patient endurance. We reduce the bad qualities in the heart. We don't do bad behavior of body or speech. And at this point, the mind still has liking and disliking, still has the sense of self. And so we need mindfulness and clear awareness to care over for the mind, to reduce the clinging in the mind, 
to see that the body is just the body, it's not a self. So we have clear awareness, we have mindfulness, and we abandon, let go of all liking and disliking for the world, all attraction and inversion with regard to the world, we put that down. And a bhikkhu practices to see the body in the body all the time, to have mindfulness and clear awareness, to put down all concerns of attraction and, and aversion with regard to the world. And the mind is constantly receiving these sense impressions that the mind clings to. So we need to practice to reduce, to remove this attraction and aversion. So we need to practice this. If we don't practice, then the mind will chase after this liking and disliking. And we see that all conditioned things, everything we chase after, everything in the world is constantly degrading and this ends in death. So we need to train, we need to practice. Whether we have a little wealth or a lot of wealth, it's enough to live. Lumpu Cha would teach that when we have a very large house, enough for a hundred people to sleep in, but when we ourselves lie down, we just need a space the size of our body. That's all we need. And there's a story of a wealthy individual from a Burmese person, but lived in France. And they came to pay respects to Venerable Ajahn Chah at Wat Nong Papong. And the monks assigned this wealthy individual a hut at the monastery that was a very small hut without electricity. And this person stayed there for two or three nights. It had no bathroom, one had to walk to the bathroom. But this person got some good uh, think, good thoughts out of this. They saw that all the material wealth, all the money they had in life, there was no value to it. It was not having anything. Just having just this little dwelling, just that little bit. He saw that was all there was to it. And so this is the Dhamma arising. He saw that in life, having wealth isn't anything. We have just this much. The Dhamma arose for this person. And so we practice not to harm each other, to have virtue, which leads to samadhi, this firm establishment of mind. So we try to practice this, to set our hearts on training in this. And we have studied a lot, we know a lot, we do work a lot, but when the time comes, it's time to put all that work down, to try to set our minds to be mindful of the body, of feeling, of the mind, to see the mind is the mind, see the mind thinking and proliferating. So we practice to have mindfulness to know the mind, and usually the mind is thinking about self, about likes and dislikes, proliferating about this and that, about the past and the future, about old memories and perceptions and so on. And if we don't train and the mind doesn't have collectedness, doesn't have samadhi, then the sense of self, the suffering, this agitation is what we get. And this sense of self and suffering and agitation, we don't want this experience. And we don't like this. We want to abandon this experience of suffering and agitation. But this disliking is just another type of craving. And so therefore we try to practice to sit and walk meditation, to observe the in and out breathing, to bring the mind to stillness to put down our worries and to train our minds in meditation and bhavana. And if we're not able to put these things down, then we have nothing but agitation and proliferation, liking and disliking. 
So in our Dharma practice, if we want wisdom, we have to train in samadhi to contemplate name and form, materiality and mentality, and to investigate, well, where is this sense of self to be found? Where is me and mine to be found? We see it as beautiful, but is it truly beautiful? And where does this beauty come from? Where is it to be found? We see the body as beautiful, and we investigate, well, what does this beauty arise from? We see that the body is a pile, is a heap. It's a collection of different parts. And we think that it's the most beautiful thing. We see it as beautiful. But when we see it as a conglomerate of various parts all gathered together, and we look at these individual parts, we see that this thing that we think is beautiful is actually composed of many things that are not beautiful. And we are lost in this body thinking that it's beautiful. This is one type of perversion or misapprehension. It's a type of wrong view. To see the body as beautiful, to see it as permanent, to see it as pleasurable, to see it as self. These are four types of perversion or misapprehension. So we practice to abandon and cure these misapprehensions, which are four types. So we contemplate the body. And sometimes when we contemplate the body, the experience of Dhamma arises in the mind. The mind is peaceful and collected already, and we have no intention to contemplate or investigate, but this Dhamma insight, experience of Dhamma, arises by itself. And sometimes we try to force it or we want it to happen quickly. But when this experience of Dhamma arises, we feel this fullness of heart, this happiness. We see the truth. And this is something that arises on its own. We see that the skin that covers the head, the hands, the legs, the arms, the torso, the feet, and so on, we peel off all that skin and the body is completely red and the blood flows out. We see that it's not self. And seeing this clearly can give rise to profound rapture and happiness and tears flowing from the eyes. The body feels very light and at ease. This is the Dhamma arising. So we bring the mind to stillness to see the body as a bag filled with unclean things. Just as it says in the text that this body is a bag filled with unclean things, filled with dirty things, just like a, a sack, a cloth sack or a bag in this case it's a bag made of skin, and all the things inside of it are unclean or dirty. If it's a bag that's completely clear, we can see everything inside of it, everything that we take to be self, all the inner organs. Or if we take the inner organs and put them outside of the body, we separate all the organs out, and we put them into a clear bag and look at it, what would that be like? We'd see the bones, we'd see the, the organs, we'd see the, the brain in the head, see the liver, the lungs, the intestines, the spleen, the heart, and so on, as well as the blood, the phlegm, the pus, the urine, the feces. We'd see it all clearly. And we see that all of these things are not beautiful. We see this, we understand that it's not beautiful. And when the mind is peaceful, then we see this body as a bag filled with urine, a bag of feces, a bag of bones, a bag of blood, a bag of pus, and so on. We see it as not beautiful. And seeing this rapture, fullness of heart, and happiness arise in the mind, this is the Dhamma arising right here. 
seeing it is not beautiful, then the mind becomes beautiful. When we see the body is not beautiful, this is the merit and goodness arising right here that's able to cut off attachment, to cut off clinging, to give rise to the state of holiness in the heart and mind. But when we see it as beautiful, then we're lost. And when we're lost a lot and we lack virtue, then this gives rise to a great amount of chaos and agitation. And when we have disliking, then this is just another type of agitation and chaos. And this goes on and on like this without end. So we train in mindfulness and clear comprehension, which is very important. And we need to have effort and perseverance in this. This effort is very important to have patient endurance as well. To get that which is good and valuable, we need patient endurance. We need to train to have virtue well established, to bring the mind to peace and collectedness, to train in mindfulness and samadhi, to make them better and stronger, to give rise to wisdom, in order to cut off the ignorance in the heart, to reduce the ignorance, to reduce the four types of misapprehension. So we practice this every single day, and may you set your hearts on this practice.